you so much for joining us tonight as we look at Genesis chapter 16. So turn there in your Bibles if you would. And for those of you who haven't listened to the previous messages in Genesis, uh, in chapter 15 that we looked at last time, the Lord encouraged Abraham uh, very much. He came to him and, and uh, reminded him of the promise that he gave him. So look at Abraham 15, 5 really quick. Uh, where the Lord, Genesis. I'm sorry, Genesis yeah. 16, excuse me, Genesis 15, verse 5, uh, where the Lord promises Abraham. He says, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So that was a big, big promise there, an encouragement from the Lord to Abraham. And then in verse 6, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, which is also recalled in much of the New Testament. He believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So that encouraged Abraham's faith, didn't it? Yeah. And encouraged his trust in the Lord for a while. And after we start trusting in the Lord with all of our heart, uh, after God blesses us in, a, in an awesome way, Satan gets busy, doesn't he? And I didn't realize this when I was a kid as a Christian. But as I grew and realized how Satan works, he usually works through people. Mm -hmm. And usually Christians mm -hmm. <laughs> coming against other Christians to discourage yep. and to bring doubt and fear. Yep. And so that's exactly what happened to Abraham here is that in the same very year, and if you don't know what year that was, I looked it up tonight, and that year was 2081 B.C. In that very year, Satan came to Abraham and began causing him to doubt. Uh, the Lord never told Abraham when they'd have that baby. Shouldn't have to. I mean, you know, in the old days, that was a surprise. They didn't know it was exactly <laughs> about nine months. They didn't have a sonogram or, or any kind of uh, way of detecting which gender it was. So, I mean, it was just like, oh, I don't know, I'm getting bigger and it ought to happen. And, and so, time after time after time again, Abraham would be looking at Sarah and, you don't look like you're getting any bigger. Are you, are you eating more? <laughs> yeah. What's going on? And, and, and then he would get sad. She'd get sad. He'd probably get mad. She'd get mad at him. And so then what would happen is they started thinking, well, you know, God said it would happen, but we're getting older and older and older. And at this point, y'all, they were 85. 85. So I'm going to go over some dates with you real quick. I looked this up today. And when God sent Abraham on his journey to go to his promised land on foot with his family and all those that uh, were his friends and helpers, uh, that was Genesis 12 and 2091 B.C. when he was 75. Now you may say, well, back then 75 wasn't what 75 is today. Yeah, it was. It was. Because remember, after the flood... The greenhouse effect left the earth and people aged quicker and he was aging pretty quickly. And then Genesis 15 that we just read where God appeared to Abraham and, and then of course what we're looking at tonight was 2081 B.C. Abraham's 85. Guess how old he was when he had Isaac? 100. Oh my. 100. Wow. You, you, know, you know why God did that? To show his power. Yeah, yeah. To show his power. God can do anything. Right, right. God can take, uh, you remember, remember uh, our brother Edward that almost turned 100 and, and God took him before he turned 100? Well, uh, you know, he and, and his wife, if he had a wife, it's just, just like that. God, it shows God's power. Yeah, yeah. But as you're getting older and, oh, I'm getting more arthritis pain and, oh, I'm not as young as I used to be. And, you know, I, I jumped off the back of the trailer and I, and I hurt my back and I, my leg's been hurt. I'm not, I'm not young like I was. I, I, I 
can't play uh, cantaloupe ball like I used to play <laughs> with the kids, you know, or, or watermelon ball. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's incredible what God can do. Yeah. And then after Isaac was a little bit older, 12 years old, they say that that was 2054 B.C., God tested him to sacrifice Isaac. So it's, it's incredible how God just proves himself, yes, isn't it? Yes. I mean, we, we look at natural things. Oh, you got to look at this, preacher. Oh, you got to see about this, preacher. And, you know, if it's God's will, it's God's will. Amen. I, I want confrontation and accountability, but I want, I want to be within God's will. Amen. Amen. And we always have reason to praise Jesus, yes. don't we? Yes. We always have reason to keep having faith, yes. peace, and joy. You know, peace and joy is evidence you're having faith. Yeah, right. And what God is going to do. Yes. See. And like I said, if we have one convert in a year, praise, praise God, God, that person's rescued from hell forever. Amen. But if we have a thousand, or Amen. ten thousand, or praise one trillion, <laughs> praise God there too, Amen. he gets all the glory. But the Bible says not that many people choose the Lord, yeah. especially in the end days with that great falling away. So you praise God for what we call the little things, which really are the big things, yeah, right? right? I mean, we were talking uh, a few months back about, hey, we might need to go ahead and change Wednesday night and Sunday night to home, home churches, you know? Just look around, you know? Sometimes there's there's 10 more, sometimes there's 20 more. Praise God yes, yes. that what God is doing, yes, you know? Yes. So, so Abraham wasn't looking at things with kingdom perspective, neither was Sarah. As we look at these, that was a long introduction one. Let's look at <laughs> Genesis 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid. Now, notice that. An Egyptian maid servant. Well, let's stop there a minute and talk about Hagar, the Egyptian servant, personal helper of Sarah, who was very wealthy, Hagar very poor, but they treat her like family. They loved her like family. But as we move on and read, all of a sudden Sarah gets a little jealous. Hagar gets a little prideful. Sarah gets more angry and mean. So let's keep reading here. And I want you to kind of remember Egyptians and Hebrews. Mm -hmm. See? Also, I want you to remember the law of the harvest. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, see now, somebody says, see now, Abram, watch out. <laughs> you know what? That could mean I got something I want you to hear. Yeah. And it may not be from God. Yeah, that's right. Or when somebody says, no way. No. God says, yes, yes way. Yes way. Yeah. <laughs> See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. You know what she was experiencing there, folks? Mm. An emotional breakdown, Absolutely. as they used to call it back in the 50s. Absolutely. Yeah. Where her emotions are controlling her thoughts, which then begin controlling her behavior. And how many times has a even a born-again, spirit-filled spouse told the other spouse, this is not God's will, we're not doing this. And then they sound so many blessings, and their life is so changed by that decision. Ooh, you got to pray it through, church. What should have Abraham done? He did the voice of who? God. Yahweh. Almighty God. Amen. Uh, here's the response. Sarah, I, I appreciate that. I love you with all my heart. And I want to help you with what you're going through, because I know it's disappointing. I know you've been sad and angry lately at me and the Lord, but uh, let's pray this through, mm -hmm. and, and I just want to love you through this. You know, there's always got to be that compassion where 
of so many men just, what are you talking about, woman? Get out of my face. You know, it's not the Lord. You know, love your enemies, which may be in your own room, you know, yeah. in your own house right. Right. for a certain period of time. Yeah. So God says, seek me. I will help you. I will lead you. I will guide you. So all of a sudden he just says, okay, okay, God's will, whatever. You're bad. If you're wrong, you're bad. Verse 3. <laughs> then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband. So she kind of walks her over to Abram and says, here you go, baby. Take her by the hand. It's okay. Now, Bible scholars believe everybody else is doing it. Mm. When, when a master of the house who was wealthy could not have children with his wife, uh, the popular thing was to go ahead and, uh, with the maid, the female's uh, servant, mm -hmm. who was like family, who was like a child to them. But it was never God's will. So this is the first time in the Bible where a child of God unites with somebody in polygamy. Mm -hmm. First time in the Bible that polygamy is mentioned. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, they, you know, God didn't say it was horrible, why didn't God punish them for that, you know uh, Solomon did it, look at all the wives Solomon had and so many others did it and, and so the answer to that is that God allows something to go on that's not his will there are negative consequences for it but, but if you seek God you're going to know, that's not, that's not right you know, look in Genesis, the husband of one wife Look throughout the New Testament, the husband of one wife. So, you know, you you, you have to, it's 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 hard enough to for a spouse to remain close and reconcile to, to that one spouse, much less a harem. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, again, never ever God's will. And, and you see all the problems here. I mean, chapter 16 shows you the problems of polygamy. That ought to be the heading here. Yeah. At the top of my 16, I have Hagar and Ishmael. It also had the problems of polygamy. You know? Yeah. Okay, so he went into Hagar. She conceived, verse 4. Uh, when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So, so most Bible scholars believe there that that Hagar had become haughty, that Abraham was probably spending more time with Hagar than he was Sarah, and that made her jealous, that made her angry. Um, he was sharing his time with the two females, uh, treating Hagar in a totally different way than he'd been treating her before, and I mean, they, they weren't talking. Mm -hmm. Despise means you have nothing to do with that person. So. They, they weren't talking. And when they did talk, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. So, uh, verse 5. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong, there you go, my bad, as they say today, my bad. My wrong be upon you. So here he's blaming on her now. It's not my fault, it's yours. It's your idea, Eve, you know. Adam didn't have to submit to Eve, did he? Neither did Abraham have to submit to Sarah. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So, so Sarah is, is saying it's all your fault. Abraham's saying it's all your fault. They were going back and forth with this, and, and God is watching. Hmm. God is saying, yeah, yeah, should have sought me in this. I, I could have led you in the right way, guys. And, and now... It's, it's all out of order. It's all chaos in the home. It was a home of order, and now it's a home of chaos. It was a home of love and care for each other and, and joy and God's spirit leading and blessing, and now it's a home of hatred and, and unforgiveness and lack of love, lack of kindness. Verse 6, so Abel said to Sarai, indeed your maid is in your hand. In other words, that's, that's your personal maid, not mine. Do to her as you please. Mm. Wow. See, where's the spiritual leadership here? Now let's pray about what God would have us to do. 
Let's pray about the best thing to do here. Uh, when I counsel people, I use solution-focused therapy. You don't look at the problem and focus on it. You focus on the one solution to the main problem. Right. And that's where they should have sought the Lord and said, here's the problem. How does God want us to start solving this in our, in our family here? When Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So she didn't have the heart to kill her. She didn't have the heart to throw her out in the desert by herself. But, but I mean, she, she was like, I'm going to just treat her as bad as I can. Maybe she'll go. I've seen, I've seen people do that to people that work in a, in a position. I've seen managers do that. I've, church members have come to me and said, my boss is just treating me horrible and, and trying to get me to leave. Mm -hmm. Well, a person who's strong in the Lord, they won't let that bug them a bit. Yeah. They're in God's will. They're going to leave what God says to leave. Yeah. See, that's the power of God, isn't it? Yes. And that's the kind of power of God we need to not let anyone influence us mm -hmm. by Satan's control and right. manipulation. Right. Right. Verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. So here she was going toward Egypt. About a 200 mile trip, folks, on foot, pregnant. And she finds this stream in the wilderness, a spring, and, and she rests there. She gets a little water and, and, and rests there. And I mean, I can see her just crying most of the way. And she didn't have an umbrella, you know. This is in the desert. This is heat. This was, you know, she could have died from that or, or uh, animals. So, so God was watching. Mm -hmm. God was caring. Now, was Hagar a believer? Most Bible scholars say probably not. Could have been. Abraham and Sarah could have uh, wanted to the true God, but probably not because Ishmael mm -hmm. was never a believer, and and we get the false beliefs of the Muslim teaching from Ishmael. See? And, and, and probably even Hagar's. So why would God even care about a lost person out in the desert? Because he's God. That's nice. Jesus said the Father has a son shine on the just and the unjust. Right. He blesses the just and the unjust. Yes. Why does he do that to the unjust? Why does he do that to those who follow Satan? Why, does he do, why doesn't he just kill people instantly when they start bothering his kids? Why does he want us to love our enemies? Because he wants them to turn to him. Yeah, see? That's why I say people that act horrible in the church, if they keep causing problems, you've got to confront them in love. But I, that's the last thing in the world I would ever want to do is tell somebody to leave or our leadership tells someone to leave because they won't repent of a sin because we want them in the hospital. Yeah. We want them in the ICU yes. yeah. so they can get help yeah. because God's word is healing. His yes. spirit is healing. Yeah. And here's what the angel said to Hagar. Hagar, Sarah's maid. Where have you come from? Where are you going? And she said, now see, the angel knew God already told the angel, so why did he ask that question? Because he wanted her to start that relationship with the angel and think about God. I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. So the angel of the Lord said to her, return, their spiritual leadership, return now. Go back to her. Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Wow. And you might say, well, why would God do that? She's treating her horrible. I mean, this is the first mention of the Bible of somebody treating their slave horrible. Why would God send them back to that? God didn't say life will be easy for anybody. Right. You know, whatever their race is, whatever their uh, uh, spirituality is, it's, it, you know, earth is hard. Mm -hmm. It gets hard sometimes. But God has a reason for everything he does. Yeah. And he's saying, go back to her. I have purpose for this. Mm -hmm. But pastor, she only went back for a while. Then they left again. When Ishmael was a little older. And, and Isaac was born. And, and, but see, God knows all the reasons why she had to go back and spend those years there. There were lots of lessons there. There was lots of spiritual growth there, see. Mm -hmm. And 
so the whole thing is God cares. And this whole time, God's trying to win them. And God gave them every opportunity to be saved. But they were not. And later, as we see here, read here, Ishmael is so angry at the way he sees his mother being treated by this harsh slave owner that he wants to kill Sarah mm -hmm. in his heart. But he refrains himself so all of his life, for generations and generations and generations, what happened? The Ishmaelites, meaning the Babylonians, the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Palestinians, always against God's people in Israel. Okay? And then, by the way, there are, uh, all the way from the whitest of the white to the blackest of the black and everything in between, there are, there's every race and every skin color Jew right. in Israel. Right. I don't know if you know that. But, you know, most of the Jews today we see on TV, you know, they're, I don't know, medium skin color, tan, whatever. They believe Jesus was tan skin. Who cares? <laughs> you know. But the reason I mention that is, is because people today have their prejudice mm. and it's, it's biblically incorrect. Yes. And it had nothing to do with her nationality as an Egyptian, right. you see. Right. Unless Sarah was prejudiced toward her because she was Egyptian, which was very wrong. So uh, God is, is, is understanding the whole picture. He sees the whole future, and he knows that, that as Ishmael grows up, he's going to be like a wild man. Mm -hmm. He's going to be an angry man, and that, that will continue. Throughout, probably until Jesus comes yeah. again, yeah. it'll continue where, where they're, they're against each other over there in that part of the land, the world. Uh, something else, too, I want you to think about as well is that God allows this kind of thing to go on because he allows people to choose to sin yeah. right. or to obey him. And, and because of the consequence of sin raining down on the earth because of what's going on over there and going on here in America with prejudice and, 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 and hate and rejection of Jesus, we, even the most spiritual, godly, Christ-like person on earth today is going to experience the consequences of that sin mm -hmm. coming down. Mm -hmm. See? And that's why Jesus said, you will suffer tribulation. You will suffer persecution. But get ready. But if you have kingdom perspective and seek me, I will become the world. Praise God. And Praise you can God. too. Yeah. So be of good cheer. Yeah. See, that's kingdom perspective. You look at it through his eyes and it all makes sense. Yeah. God, what's going on? Uh, oh God, what can it be like it was in the good old days? And, and Don's always getting on me for that. You know, you <laughs> If I, I, I told her if I could live back in the 50s and it would never change, awesome. I was born 1960, but from 60 to 64, it was still like the 50s. So I, I, on my Facebook page, I said, welcome back to the 50s. And I, all these pictures of the 50s, you know. Uh, I, I love to watch movies about the 50s and leave it to Beaver and all that. But, but, but the point here is, is we're in the present. She reminds me of that sometimes. We're in the present and, and you have to deal with the present right. and look at it and be cheerful because God is up to something in the amen. present. Amen. amen. Okay. Yeah. And it may not look the way we want it to look, <laughs> yeah. but God is up to something. Yes. As Donna reminded us of that song the other night, when, when it looks like and seems like God's not working, God is working. Yes, is. Yeah. So praise him and be of good cheer. Amen. So verse 10, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descent. So he's, he's encouraging her here. So that they shall not be counted. Uh, they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. You know, that, that's something there that most people don't know or understand. The word Ish, the name Ishmael means God hears. That's why God wanted to remind her every time she said Ishmael, God still hears you. Mm. God still loves you. <laughs> God still cares. Mm. Don't reject the true mm. God. Mm -hmm. 
because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. There it is. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now before we get upset with the Palestinians and the Ishmaelites and all those over there that fight the, the Jews in Israel, I want you to remember this too, that you, you think about what happened after this. You think about the law of the harvest, the consequences of the sin of Sarah and Abraham. And being so cruel to Haggai and, and, to, and to Ishmael. And, and what happens later? Well, they, the Hebrews become the slaves, hundreds, thousands of them, slaves of the Egyptians. Harsh. I mean, every year it became more harsh and cruel slavery until God sent Moses. But... So many of those who were Jews, just like today, rejected the true Messiah, rejected the true God Yahweh, excluded him from their lives. And so what happens? Even when they're set free and, and go into the wilderness, wanderings toward the promised land, so many of them want to worship a golden calf. Yeah. 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 So many of them want to say, Moses, you're, you're a jerk. We're not going to listen to you. That's what God do. He had to kill so many Hebrews who are being horrible examples for the rest of them in the group. So God put their lives out, put their lights out. Because why? God was teaching and training them, see, to be followers of him and to respect God's man, Moses, who spoke for God. So God knew what he was doing. And then when God's people began to come back to God and obey God and have that relationship, that love relationship with Yahweh, what happens? It just gets better and better. You have David on the throne. You have him conquering all the people around him, trying to overtake Israel. I mean, it's just, it's heaven on earth. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. So let's get back to these scriptures here. Oh, by the way, um, talking about the wild child, okay? <laughs> and that wild spirit that's in those of, of this seed, the generational sin. I was driving in Dallas when I pastored in Dallas, about 1990, 91, and uh, I was on Mockingbird Lane where I grew up, driving down that busy road, it's kind of like a highway now, and this, I had on the back of my car window, Jesus in huge letters, and then underneath that, the only way to heaven, John 14, 6. And all of a sudden, this, I hear this, bah, 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 bah. and I look to the side, and this guy has his window out screaming at me, and, and, and he starts going like that, and he shoots me in the finger, I'm like, what's going on? And it was, it was one of Ishmael's descendants who didn't like my sticker on my car, and I said, Lord, thank you that he didn't have a gun. <laughs> yeah. So it's that same spirit. And, and what's sad is, is that's from the devil. And today so many of the, uh, even Christians act that way. that are born again because of Satan's influence. Okay, let's keep going. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. Now, now here she's got all this bad news from God and she still goes to him. She called on him. And she said that Yahweh, you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. And what that means, I want to look that up really quick here in my notes. Uh, that means the brook of the one who sees. So see, she's so impressed with that, that God is watching over me and caring about me and loving me. So that brook will always, that well will always remind her of the Lord. So uh, it was between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So, take notes tonight. 
The title of the message is The Stages of Chaos. <laughs> so we need to be aware, don't we? The yeah. Bible here right. is telling us very plainly in Genesis 16 that we can repent of this. We don't have to have chaos in our home, in our relationships, in our business, or our church. God's a God of order. Amen. God's got joy. God's got peace. God's got rejoicing. God's got cheer. Amen. Now, does that mean we can never be upset? No. But usually when we're upset, it's because either of what Satan's done, and we have a good reason for it, but, but sometimes it's because we have a lack of faith. And that's just sin, folks. Uh, but even after tragedy happens, like death of a loved one or a loss of some kind, God helps us through that, doesn't yeah, he? Right. The stage of chaos. Stage one, crisis of faith. That usually is how chaos begins, even for an unbeliever. When 9-11 happened, how many people lost faith that they were safe? Mm -hmm. You know, I may not live to see tomorrow. I may go to hell forever. Wow. You know, I don't have 30, 40 more years to get right with God. So what happens? The Sunday after 9-11, every church is full. Yeah. It was so funny when we were in Prestonwood, and it was so full we had to sit in the balcony. Huge, <laughs> giant church. How many seats in there? 8,500 8, seats in that. Ooh, I don't know that was that big. But but we had to sit in the balcony, and and the balcony still had the things behind the chairs with the hymn, hymnals in them. Okay, and so when they came to that first song on the big screen, you know we knew the words were going to be there. Nobody used the hymnal anymore. So these people that, that were sitting beside us, we were like this with people sitting beside us. All of a sudden they grab the handle before somebody else does. And then they realize, oh, they're not using it. Like <laughs> Crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we doubt God. And, and when we doubt God, when we fear, if we keep that up and don't repent of it, it just keeps yeah. a ball yeah. rolling, yeah. getting bigger. Stage two. Crisis of relationship. When faith breaks down, relationships break down. Mm -hmm. Because sin keeps building. Problems keep building. And so, usually, when two people that love each other dearly begin to fight and begin to have unforgiveness, it's because why? They're not walking that close to Jesus. Yeah. They may be having ritualistic prayer and Bible study or, or whatever you want to call it. That would be practicing impure religion. But pure religion is you walk close to Jesus close every day is first love. And whatever he says in his word to do and, and he t talks to you in his spirit during your time with him alone, you're going to do it. Yes. Which means you're not going to get what you want. Right. What about me? Yeah. You're going to get what? God says it's best. Yeah. You're going to yeah. do what God says. But if you don't, guess what? I'm not forgiving them. Mm -hmm. They ain't come to me. You know, it's that pride, see? Yeah. And that's what Hagar had when she became pregnant. She got, had that pride. And then Sarah had that pride. And it was just, mm -hmm. it was chaos, wasn't it? And relationships broke down. Sarah's relationship with Abraham broke down. Stage three crisis of consequences. All that sin, unrepentant sin, begins to have the consequences and the family falls apart. The church falls apart. Mm -hmm. The business falls apart. Mm -hmm. Because people won't do things God's way. Yeah. Consequences. One after the other. God gives you time to repent. You don't repent. There's more consequences. It gets worse and worse. Until eventually death. You get to heaven God says, why didn't you just listen to me? I had so much more for you to do. I had, I had better things to accomplish than what you thought. The stages of chaos. Number four, stage four, a gift of goodness. See, God intervenes, doesn't he? And God came down to Haggai and said, hey, listen, I, I want you to know, I see what's going on. I heard everything she said. I'm so sorry that my child treated you that way. And I want you to know that's not me. That's not me. I didn't have her do that. And so many people will not go to church 
They will not come to Jesus because they know a Christian yeah. Yeah. that well, didn't, didn't yeah. act right, didn't talk right, didn't treat somebody right, yeah. wouldn't forgive, yeah. prideful, hateful. Yeah. And you know what? I don't need to go to church to get that. I can get that out in the world. My yeah. People I work with, if my work's nicer than that Christian I knew. Yeah. Let God, Spirit, fill you and live through you to give one after another the gift of goodness. Amen. And Haggai was blessed, and others will be blessed. Remember the prayer that you're supposed to be praying every morning. Jesus, fill me with your Spirit. Help me to watch and pray for opportunities to be a blessing to others. Yeah. If you mean that prayer, we'll guess what? It's going to happen. That's right. And you're going to have testimony. Yes. Let's pray. <laughs> Jesus, thank you so much for chapter 16 of Genesis. Thank you so much for how you've spoken to us tonight. We give you all the glory. And Lord, we just ask that when we see chaos coming, and it's always in the form of a lie of the enemy. It's always in the form of, of Satan leading someone to do something or say something that's out of God's will that would pull another person down mm -hmm. and harm another person. Take away a blessing. Take away joy. Take away faith. Take away optimism. God, help us. Help us to be quiet and to seek you and only speak the words from God, we've all been guilty. That's why we need a Savior. And Lord, we will be guilty. And that's why we need to remember from this day forward to go to you in order that we would be able to be empowered by you to say no to the devil and yes to your will and live the truth that we know. And we want to give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you all so much for listening. May God bless you.